start, our first speaker today is going to be Ms. Gretchen Reynolds from the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ms. Reynolds with us. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for having me, and howdy. <laughs> howdy. I'm, I'm here to talk about how you can get good science to what those of us who live in it call the real world um, outside of academia. And so I want to start by talking about stories. And obviously, journalism is about stories, but so, in fact, is science. And if you're talking about health-related topics, then it's really the story of the human body, which is of tremendous interest to all of us who own one, which is everybody. We want to know how does it work, how can it work better, what's going wrong, um, how can I train, all those sorts of questions. And people really, really want that information, especially out in the real world. Um, I, I note on here, last year, which was a pretty big year for news. Eight of the most read and most emailed stories of the year at the New York Times were health stories. And that was with Trump. So how do you, if you are a scientist or a student, how do you find the story in your research? And I think there are essentially three questions that you need to be able to answer. And so you need to be able to answer them well. And the first is, why did I do this study? Why was it done? What question is this study answering that we didn't already have an answer for? And that's really telling the backstory of your study. And it's really important for those of us out in the world to understand why this story was done, what's the context, um, and also why you, as a scientist, were interested in this study. There's no reason at all why you cannot be part of this story. If you study running because you're a runner, that's of interest to me as someone who might write about it. The second question, and I think a lot of scientists actually discount how important this is to those of us in the real world, how did you do this study? Methods are really, really interesting to those of us who are not in the lab. This study that I show right here, um, it's actually, it was one of the most emailed and most read stories of 2016. And it's partly because it was about exercise in the brain, but it's also because it was a, store, or a study that looked at not just rats that ran, but also looked at rats, rats that did high-intensity interval training, and rats that did weight training. And maybe those of you who study exercise science, none of that is news, but for New York Times readers and for me, it was really interesting that there's a model of weight training in rats. And so I think one of the reasons that story was so popular is because the methods themselves were interesting, and also because it turned out that running was actually the, the best for building more neurons in your brain, and everyone wants to hear that. But the single most important question, if you are going to get science out to the rest of the world, is the so what question. And in health reporting especially, so what is at the bottom of every story that I write or any health reporter writes. Th these are basically service stories, meaning they're meant to tell people how to live their life better, how to make themselves healthier. So if you want a journalist to pay attention to your research, the most important thing you need to be able to tell me is why does this story, or why does this study matter? What is a reader going to learn from it? And sometimes that's very obvious, and sometimes it's less so. So you really do have to make sure that you can articulate the takeaway, the so what. And in one case, I, I wrote a story about a study that looked at the biomechanics of breaking the two-hour marathon. Um, and, you know, obviously that kind of study is going to be oriented primarily towards very elite runners. So when I called the scientists to set up an interview, I said, 
can you make sure that you can tell me what this means for the rest of us? And they sat down and they figured out some of the math of what it would mean to draft in a certain way for those of us who are 10-minute milers, not you know, four and a half minute milers. The, the other study was actually a very sophisticated look at how even a week of running can change the, the shape and the structure of neurons in the brain. And that was a rodent study, and it was very much a, you know, a cellular study. But the takeaway was the simple one of it looks like, even although this was an animal study, that moving is going to change the, the, the basic cells in your brain from the moment they're born. And that's a great message. So make sure you know what the takeaway is. Once you can answer those questions, <laughs> the really difficult problem is reaching people like me. Um, it's not easy. And I know in the age of social media, a lot of people think you can just tweet someone like me uh, a link to your study. I won't open it. Um, if I don't know you, and most journalists are the same, if we don't know you, we're not going to look at it. So I still think there's a really important place for the old-fashioned gatekeepers. Sit down with the press office. Go through how, to, how your study works, how they can write a press release. Those go to people like me. I will read that. Um, <laughs> this is how, how do you actually talk to a reporter. Um, I'm not joking when I say words of one syllable. You cannot overestimate how little most of us know. I'm an English major. A lot of journalists are journalism majors. We may not have had a science class in 20, 30 years. Um, and that's actually good because that allows us to ask you the kind of really dumb questions that allow us to then translate the information for everyone out in the real world. So if someone asks you a really dumb question, be patient. Be very clear about the issues of causation and correlation, because most of us who are science journalists, I've gotten pretty good at, at not conflating the two. You will find a lot of people have not. And you'll also find that even if the journalist understands it, their headline writer may not. So be very clear about what your study actually shows, what it doesn't show, the limitations. <laughs> if it's only in men, if it's only in mice, point that out to the reporter, because otherwise we may not get it right. I'm going to real quickly tell you the genesis of the most popular story that I've written so far this year. And it tells you a couple of things. One is that people want to live forever. So if you say, Here, here's information about how to live forever, um, that's going to make it popular. But it began as a study in the Journal of Applied Physiology, which is not exactly general interest reading. It's actually, a, as journals go, it's pretty easy to read. No one outside of academia is going to read it. I will read the tables of contents, but I often miss good studies. In this case, I got a press release. I noticed the press release. I thought it was really interesting. And so the press release is what actually got me to write about this topic. And as I said, it, as of right now, it's one of the most emailed and most read stories of 2017. I also want to talk real quickly about the dangers of what I, I use the technical term, woo-woo, um, junk science, hokum, bunk, whatever you want to call it. I'm borrowing a term from Louise Burke. She's a professor at the um, Australian Institute of Science. I loved the idea of scienciness, which is like truthiness from the Colbert show. It's basically science and reporting that are truth adjacent. There, there may be an element in them, but it's exaggerated, overblown, promises way too much. It also can be extremely popular. Those of you who know Dr. Oz, um, I'm not going to make fun of him. He's made a lot of money. He's very popular. What he does is woo-woo. It's not, what he does anymore is woo-woo. 
um, he will invariably find some study that shows that some obscure plant from, from the Amazon will in fact cure diabetes, make you lose weight in five minutes, and people will pay attention to that. So in some ways, you have to decide as a scientist to what extent you want to participate in woo-woo, to what extent you want to have your work appear that way. Um, and if you are wondering if a reporter actually, if a reporter's work is woo-woo, these are some of the tells that I look for when I'm reading things. I hate the term life hack. I, I don't know if any of you <laughs> use it when you talk about your work. I think it used to be called household hints, and now it's life hacks. Um, there are lots of things that you, or lots of ways that you can spin your science to make it somehow seem more palatable, that essentially make it woo-woo. And you may become famous, you may become rich, but you will also become the once respected neuroscientist, um, neurosurgeon you have to decide what kind of career you want. And I would tell you, it's a really, really good time to be doing science about health. And this, the study I have put here, um, it's not even really a study, this is the single most popular story I have ever written. I'm abashed to say that. Um, it has been downloaded, I think, 20 million times from the New York Times. It's the single most popular health story that is ever run at nytimes.com. And it's not because it's a great workout, it's not because I wrote about it well, it's not even because it only takes seven minutes, it's because it had the word scientific in the headline. And whether that's completely merited or not, I, I, I don't know, I might change it now. Um, but people really want health information that they can put to use that can make their lives better and that has authority and scientific backing. So now is a really great time to be doing health-related science. If you do good science, you get it to me, I will write about it and millions of people will read it and change their lives, at least to some extent, we hope, as a result. So the synergy is really great. Everybody benefits. If you do good science, get it to me, and I will do my best to, do, to report it accurately. Um, and then you'll get more NIH grants and send me more studies, and the synergy will continue. So anyway, thank you so much for having me, and gig <laughs> Great job, Gretchen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We, we've got a couple of questions for you. Now, mm -hmm. you talked about the most popular story you've written in the last year. Uh -huh. you, you talked about the one that got the most hits. From a personal perspective, uh, Alex uh, from here in College Station actually sent this question. What's the most um, fascinating study that you've ever covered? Our story you've ever read. The, for me, personally, the one, it, it, it no longer will seem groundbreaking, but about eight years ago, I wrote a column that we headlined, Lobes of Steel, which is also a headline I really like. And it was actually one of the first um, times that anyone covered the impacts that exercise could have on neurogenesis, which is obviously the creation of new brain cells in the adult brain. And I had learned, when I last had biology, um, that you only have a certain number of brain cells and you kill them off with beer and you're done. Um, so it was really revelatory. There's a lot, there's a lot of laughter about <laughs> I that. I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that wasn't that long ago. And, and there are still a lot of people out in the, the real world who have never heard that you can make more brain cells. And the fact that exercise amplified neurogenesis was people were hugely interested, and it got me. I, I run constantly, mostly for my brain. Excellent. So we have another question. What advice do you have for students looking for a way into the scientific journalism world? Uh, <laughs> well, the, the good and bad news is science journalism is actually really large right now. There are all kinds of blogs. There are all sorts of um, websites. 
There's a lot of places that want content about good science. A lot of them aren't paying anything. So that's the trade-off, is a lot of the internet sites, uh, the, the amount of money that you will make doing that can be very small. Um, if you find a good site that has big readership, they will usually take almost any content that is competent, and that, that's how you get clips. So we just got one, just came in, says, what is the one thing that would cause you to disregard a press release? <laughs> Misspelling, uh, to start with. <laughs> and also, if, if it's clear to me that the, the headline and the text are really overselling the study, or if the, the press release itself doesn't know the difference between causation and correlation, which is a really, really big issue in health reporting. We get it wrong a lot, and I try very hard personally not to, to um, confuse causation and correlation. The press releases often do, and if they get that wrong, the story will get it wrong. Thank you so much for your time. Please join me in thanking Ms. Reynolds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.